I had a unique answer to prayer in the, in the Ark, Oklahoma camp. A woman came, she'd been a school teacher, and she said she hadn't been able to sleep for three months, and she was just ready for a breakdown. And I had a prayer, and then I gave an address, and she fell sound asleep in the middle of my speech. <laughs> There's a little girl who said, uh, I love to see my preacher's eyes. I think they are divine. But when he prays, he closes his. And when he preaches, mine. <laughs> uh, a woman was asked, an elderly spinster woman was asked if she could take a delegate for a convention. She said no, she didn't want to bother, but later she changed her mind and said she could take three. Three? Why, we thought you only had one spare room and one spare bed. Yes, she said, but I just heard it was a Baptist convention, and Baptists are so narrow, I thought three could occupy one bed. <laughs> now, uh, now, you Methodists shouldn't laugh, because Methodists are just Baptists that can read and write. <laughs> and Presbyterians are just Methodists that have had a college education. And Episcopalians are just Presbyterians that made a lot of money. Now, my father was brought up a Methodist. My mother's brought up a Presbyterian, and when they married, they compromised and became Congregationalists. I was brought up a Congregationalist, my wife was brought up a Presbyterian, and when we married, we compromised and became Presbyterian. <laughs> uh, I'm going to um, uh, fly with Mary Light up to Coronas. It's going to touch the heartstrings a great deal for our Coronas. It's where we started the camp farthest out 25 years ago. It is filled with associations. My little children have gr were little children then. 25 years, they've grown, have children of their own. Uh, I have uh, been away once on a trip to Europe, uh, so I missed one of them. The only one that has never missed a camp uh, has been Marion, the wife of Norman Elliot. Uh, my daughter Marion, and I trust she'll be out there at least for a few days. She'd like to keep her record clear. But <clears throat> my uh, my wife found it hard to understand all this at first, and uh, uh, she's very, very uh, almost, I won't say a conventional Presbyterian, but she didn't like to uh, think of going going out into that. To, that no man's land out there, so far away from some of the, uh, those restrictions where you said, where some believed you shouldn't expect any answers to prayer. But when she did begin to get it, she began to be the greatest help you ever could have found. A woman would come up, for instance, and say, uh, oh, Mrs. Clark, I'm not understanding everything that uh, Dr. Clark is saying, and he's so busy, I hate to take his time, and, uh, and then she would say, oh, you find it hard to understand him too. Well, so did I. Uh, let's go out in the boat this afternoon and we'll talk it over. And so she pulled him up from the edges. And she knew all those, and she, she had a gift of knowing names. 200 people, the third day she'd know everybody by name. Uh, she would go where the wallflowers were and uh, bring them out. And... Uh, uh, never did we have a chance to sit to, uh, together at a meal because she would have to be with helping some while I was helping others. And we made a rule that uh, husbands and wives couldn't sit together at, at meals but once a day. And we became, and we, we, the result is we spread all the values everywhere. Now it so happened that my oldest, my uh, Marion had uh, two uh, children and is going to expect another. And the doctors said that Helen May couldn't have any babies. And so they were looking around in the orphan asylums to adopt one. And my, uh, and Marion said, I know Helen May could have a baby, so I said, let's pray about it. And presently we heard she was going to have one. And I said, I could just see her mother up in heaven uh, saying there's a better assortment up here to select from than down in the orphan asylums. So I'll pick one out myself and send it down personally. The baby was due the 1st of July. July went by and no baby. Uh, August 4th came, which was my wife's birthday, and a telegram, little Glenn just arrived. I said, that's just like Louise. She arranged to have it come on her birthday, so we all knew that, know that she had something to do about it. Two years later, she used to, we heard Helen May used to have another baby. 
Uh, the last of August, but when August 4th came, a little garden just arrived. And I said, Louise, you're doing a fine job. <laughs> now, little Glen and Garden were down at the Ohio camp. Uh, uh, seven and five. And uh, they'd both come down in infantile paralysis. And we just, and her mother and the father rose to great heights of faith. A uh, little garden has a very, very slight limp which may be exercised out. But I wanted to say this. Uh, we felt very close to each other, and I felt very close to Louise, always. She loved flowers. She knew all of them by name. She raised them, lived with them, uh, drew lessons from them. I hardly ever noticed flowers. Uh, because I was so busy looking at faces. When I was a boy, I found a no phrenology book. And I found that you, by, you could tell people's character by the bumps on their heads and the shape of the noses. And, and I became just a little boy, fascinating and, and, and reading everybody's character. And I had, we had a lot of brothers and sisters. They'd come in every day and say, how's, how's my uh, bump of uh, humility developed? And uh, one little, a little cousin, she had a big bump of self-esteem, and she's so anxious to become humble. And one day she came in crying. She said, I was very humble all day. I just, all, just thought it was so wonderful. And then I found myself uh, tonight, I was so proud of being humble that I spoiled it all. <laughs> well, the one value of phrenology is this. It makes you look at people. And if you look at whatever you look at, you love. So I suggest you go home looking at people with the new eyes, looking through them. I don't look at their heads now to see, read their character. I look at their eyes to read their souls. I have a unique sensitivity to seeing the spiritual souls and seeing it through their eyes. And I, that's one thing I've been noticing here, uh, the light in your eyes. Now, <coughs> this book, that is officially coming out on August 4th. Uh, will have a, uh, it has a very special significance coming out in just two days from now, officially. And some of you, this is the first place where the some got on a pre-publication uh, 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 gifts or signed up for them. But I want to say that, that um, uh, after Louise died, we found a little um, uh, secret journal uh, she had kept, and I published it, called Stepping Heavenward. Uh, in there are some of the most interesting meditations. One was uh, this, this spring we put some gunny sacking over, uh, uh, over the, uh, some plants. And uh, the sun that way was uh, permitted, it. That, uh, that gave a protection. And then when... Um, that uh, gunny sacking was removed, all that, those, that growth had come up so much better than this over here that had been exposed to the cold and everything. And uh, that is the way life is, she said. We should uh, protect ourselves, going into little quiet times to have uh, uh, that little protection uh, and then let the soul grow faster. One day, my wife prepared waffles uh, they're using the old-fashioned waffle iron, cast iron, waffle iron, and knowing that we would eat them faster than she could supply them, she had a, a little stack already uh, prepared. And as we would be eating, we would uh, be removing that stack, and she'd be bringing in more, but, but uh, we were eating faster than they were bringing brought in, but never did we get fast enough to reach the bottom one. And after some time, I noticed that bottom one was growing... Uh, clammier and, uh, and uh, damper and soggier and uh, more unpalatable all the time. And finally, she said, this is the last one, and I saw that someone would have to take that bottom one. So with parental sacrifice, I put my fork on her and drew it out, took a look at the sad thing, and then I went out to the kitchen. I looked at the hot steaming waffle iron, the fire was turned off. I lifted the lid and laid this on, and to uh, my surprise, the corrugations in the waffle fitted the corrugations in the waffle iron. I put down the lid, steaming hot, and I left it there a little while. And then I opened it and took it out, 
crisp, fresh, uh, uh, and lo and behold, the waffle which the builders had rejected had become the head of the corner. Uh, that gave me an inspiration, and I went to my class in poetry that morning, and I said, uh, Wordsworth tells of going out and looking upon a field of daffodils, and that uh, often in quiet times, and on his couch he lie, and I, I lie, I, uh, that uh, beautiful view of daffodils uh, reached my uh, play upon my inward eye, and in this period of solitude, way away, months later, years later, all he has to do is to vision that that wonderful picture, and it just lifts, freshens his whole day up. So I asked them, as a result of studying these poets, I'd like to have you tell me what is your waffle iron when your life is gets uh, clammy and uh, flat and unprofitable. What is it that uh, just the memory of it lifts you? It's fascinating to hear the result. Uh, some, it was the mother, perhaps the mother that was in heaven. With some, it was a verse in the Bible that freshened them up, gave them new steam and life. With some, it was a special picture of Jesus, or a little altar they may have had in their home. With some, it was a little quiet nook in the, over in the hills where they like to walk up sometime and just sit and uh, let big thoughts fall out of the trees into their minds. Uh, some, it was a, it was a, was a sweetheart, uh, just thinking of that sweetheart and her unselfish, lovely love. That to me became a very precious thing. I began to then look about me. And I'm one reason I mention this is when, as you go away, I wanted the values of the caps farthest out. There may be certain experiences. All you have to do is get quiet and relive those. See a face. Uh, feel a handshake. Uh, think of a few moments you had in the prayer room, a verse from the Bible, or a affirmation that you, were, you, were, that you had used one of those days, uh, what are, what is your waffle iron? Frank Laubach gathers pictures of Jesus, and when he goes to a hotel and he's alone and lonesome, he put those all around the wall. He, he is a, basically a homely man homelier than Abraham Lincoln, who was, they've talked about the homeliness of Lincoln, but as you notice, as he grew old, uh, he became more like Jesus. But Frank Laubach has become very much like Jesus. A homely face can become a radiant face. Looking at the face of Jesus, that was his. Uh, one uh, Bishop Raines of the Indiana, uh, came to St. Paul as a young man. He just took people by storm. His church was packed. He became known as the greatest pulpit artist of the Northwest. A young man just in the early 30s, and he used to invite me to come over to his uh, sometimes. He said, get on your, uh, and you spend the night, uh, in the evening, and uh, put on your roughing rags, and uh, sweater and all, might be winter time, and he'd ride out to a cabin, sit before the fire and talk, and then he'd kneel down and say, put your hand on my head and pray that I be kept humble. Uh, and uh, then in the morning we would talk it over further as he rode back. And someday Dr. sometimes Dr. Body, who was his rival, pulpit orator, two men that they often were part of the bait as to which was the most wonderful preacher, and they met once a week. To uh, Dr. Body being older, helped uh, Dr. Ray in preparing his sermon. Uh, a fellowship, a comradeship. Uh, Dr. Ray said that he had a room where he had the pictures of all the men who had influenced him most. Uh, it's a room that could not be reached, excepting I think by a, uh, by, a ele by a ladder and through a trap door. So no one else could go there. When he was there, this secretary would say if anyone called up that he's not in. Uh, he would have a period that way of complete isolation. And if he had a problem to a solve, he'd say, I've decided 
uh, not to accept this uh, office as bishop of Indiana. And he looked at the faces and they all frowned. He said, well, I believe maybe I will accept it. And they all smiled. I don't know how he got those reactions, but actually they seemed to speak to him because he was so, they, it was almost like he vibrated into their very vibrations. He would catch almost by radio and enter something from those faces. You might try that. Have a picture of Jesus. And uh, if you go in and look at it often, and sometimes you can ask a question and just see if that, if that face seems to change. It's strange the vi vi vibrations come. Dr. Carver uh, would talk with the little flowers. He uh, went out at 4 o'clock in the morning and he said, Dear Mr. Creator, what was the universe made for? And the, almost that little flower is like a re receiving set because he loved flowers. As I say, I wasn't able to love them like that. I, I can, I love people so that the faces, I think the faces speak to me. And the Lord said, that's too big a question for a little man like you. Well, dear Mr. Creator, what is the man made for? Well, that's still too big a question. Reduce the extent and increase the intent of your question. Well, dear Mr. Creator, what was the peanut made for? Well, now you're down around your size. What did you want to do with the peanut? I'd like to make milk out of the peanut. Uh, Jersey cow milk or plain boarding house milk? I want to make Jersey cow milk. And 300 uses for the sweet of the peanut came through him. 150 uses of the of the uh, of, of the sweet potato, and he remade the agriculture of the South. Instead of just wearing out the soil with cotton, and the boll weevil came in and that began to destroy the crops. He simply saved the the South, and he said, "I don't take any books into the uh, God's little laboratory. All I take is a 29th verse of the first chapter of Genesis. I'm not going to tell you what it is, so when you go home you'll sweep the dust off your Bible and turn to the first chapter of Genesis and read the 29th verse. So you take, I, the other day I said, uh, you know, I fired the gun and we all went into the promised land and everyone grabbed a, staked out a claim. Take hold of one of those promises as your waffle iron. When you go, life goes uh, snowed under, stale and unprofitable and soggy and sad, just Put yourself back on that for a little while and just rest until it, you're all fresh and, uh, and palatable again. Well, all those ways of, um, of finding uh, that union with, with, uh, uh, with uh, Jesus, to touch base, to really get back, um, like the wire that's fallen, a lost connection with the uh, power system, to get back. Like the trolley that's on the streetcar gets off. Put it back. And every once in a while, your trolley gets off, and that's one way you can get back. There was a great orator, I consider him the greatest orator of modern times, Henry Grady, editor of the uh, Atlanta Constitution. He was a bachelor. At the age of 35, he'd lost his faith. he lost his uh, sap, his vit vividness, his uh, enthusiasm. Um, he uh, was uh, getting stale, flat, and unprofitable. Uh, he, his father had been killed fighting on the southern side and the Civil War. This was back in the 80s. And he got a call to come to New York and give an address before the descendants of the Mayflower, a uh, blue-stocking uh, New England group, a very vigorously, you know, a union, uh, uh, anti-slavery anti and all that and uh, to come up and talk on the New South. Well, how could he get uh, pep and freshness and power to give an address like that? They're still waving the red uh, rag of, uh, of uh, hate between the North and the South. Ku Klux Klan was active and everything else. Well, as I say, he was, uh, his father had been killed, but his mother was living out at the old farm. So we went back there, appeared there one day, and he said, Mother, I've come back to be a boy again. I want to spend a week here and see if I can't recapture something. I want to go to the, um, I want to go to the, uh, out and feed the chickens, and I want to scratch the little pigs uh, uh, behind their ears and hear them squeal again. I want to, I want you to make corn pone like you used to make it. And uh, when uh, night comes, I want to kneel at your knee and say that little prayer I used to say. See if I can recapture some faith in something. And when I go to bed, I want you to come and tuck me in like you did when you uh, I was a little boy and sing that song about, about that sweet song about Jesus. 
And so he was there for a week, and he went back, and he went to New York, and he gave the greatest oration in the history of America on the New South. Uh, a book which I don't have out here, The World's Greatest Debate, a compilation that may go in history someday of the great, all the great debate over North, between North and South of all the different periods. I enclose that as the greatest oration. The only oration addresses I think are greater are Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and the second inaugural. I took my track team down to Des Moines, Iowa uh, one spring and uh, after I took the boys in bed, I uh, thought I'd go back up to the, old, the, the place where we, I used to live, the little cottage on, on, uh, on 7th Street. And I walked up the, and walked up the old 6th Street hill, went over, stood in front of the um, old Crocker School where I played black man and, and tag and all that. And I could look across there, standing right by the drugstore, I could look across that, that playground over onto 7th Street where our little cottage was, and there was a light in it. I, for a moment, I, I, years just rolled by, and there my, I could just see my father and mother sitting in, by the evening lamp, reading to their six children from uh, uh, Black Beauty and, uh, and Little Women, and David Copperfield. And they'd sent the oldest son over to the drugstore to get uh, some castoria for the t little twins or a little ice cream for the family or something. And as I stood there, I just overwhelmed with homesickness. My father and mother were gone to heaven. My, my favorite brother was, was in heaven. I was homesick and no home to go to. I went over... The, Went out, stood in front of the little cottage, went up into the yard, stood there right by the porch where we played. And I'd fallen, jumped over and got my foot caught in the, uh, between the a little post and the, and the porch and hung by my foot for a little while. I remembered all those things and how, how we played up and down that uh, run sheep running all around there. And then I went up to the porch, just ready to go up and ring the bell, not to ring the bell, just walk right in and say, well, here... Uh, father and mother, here I am. But no, I couldn't go in. I took my footsteps rather slowly back to the hotel. But the next morning, after the men got, boy, I gave them a little airing, and then I had them lie down and rest for the great contest in the, in the relay races that afternoon. Now they were all tucked in. I slipped away, went up that hill again, went over, and I walked right straight up to the 1014 7th Street, Stood there on the porch before the, in the little, before the little cottage and rang the bell, and a little white-haired lady came that looked just like my mother. And I just stood and looked down at her. Presently, the silence was getting a little awkward. Oh, I said, I'm not a, I'm not a fuller brush man. I'm a, I, I, um, well, my uh, father built this house, or had it built. Oh, come in, she said, come right in. And, uh, she, and she said, sit down, and there was the mantel, the fireplace where we all hung our stockings, and all came out there in our little nightgowns and opened our stockings first before we opened the sliding doors after breakfast and went into the parlor. The parlor was always shut off, cold all winter, but we warmed it up for uh, Christmas, and there was always a great Christmas tree and all that. I sat there... And she said, your father's name is Captain Clark, wasn't he? I said, yes. And he, his wife wanted, uh, wanted the one room finished in Cherry. Yes. Only a house in town that had one finished in, in Cherry. And he had to send to Davenport to have that. Well, I said, I didn't. I said, that's interesting. Yes, she said, I knew that, that we knew the contractor. And he uh, said he had great joy in building this house. And we understand you used to have a Negro maid. His uh, uh, mother had been a slave. I said, yes. And, uh, and uh, you had the kitchen downstairs, yes, and we had a dumb waiter uh, that, we, uh, that we would um, she'd send the food up in. And at night, we would bet that dumb, the, the, the uh, elevator down, and I'd stand down in there, and we'd, I, we'd have Punch and Judy show. And we'd open the sliding door, and oh, yes, well, I went on telling her about these things, and she told me things. She said, <clears throat> we've lived here 
13 years. My husband had a chance to sell this house. And he came and he put his elbow on that mantle and he said, Carrie, we've been happier here than we've ever been in all our life. I have a feeling that every plank in this building was put here with love. Don't let's sell it. Well, you know, my heart just went right out. There, there it was. I had never heard my father and mother quarrel. Uh, when we went out and moved out to the big house, uh, state and Sunnyside, we call it Sunnyside and Oak Park, uh, folks uh, who have uh, known my family uh, in the past have come to Camp Father Stout and said, we believe that your Camp Father Stout is just an extension of Sunnyside. And all I have to do, folks, is to sit down and just see that family as they sat around that big porch out at Sunnyside. And I daydream sometimes aloud, and, and we talked, and we had the love and the prayers of each other. And I can see now why my daydreams come true, because they always, I, got, I, I could get in focus, in harmony. And I felt so sadly for those who didn't have that. And I take my hat off to a man like Star Daly, who uh, for 25 years lived in the underworld and knew no harmony, nothing but discard, nothing but hate. They're the ones that deserve the credit. I don't deserve the credit. But I'm here to say this. Get hold of that memory, that face, that verse that to you can bring you in harmony. And if you want a quick uh, builder up, uh, pick me up. Don't run in and get a, a bottle of uh, uh, Coca-Cola and some turn to stronger th th drinks. Don't think you have to just depend on coffee or anything else. Uh, if you have uh, in a situation where you're filled with some fear or something, grab hold of things fast. And so on the p top of the page, the top of the page 39, and I will lift up my eyes, I put a prayer and I, because there's a prayer at the end of each made a uh, day's study in that book. That, if you want to mark that prayer as one a thing to give you a quick pick up if I wake up at night filled with worry or fear, I just to say something like this or pray something like this. I have any father we know that thou art a God of love, giver of every good and perfect gift in whom there's no variation, neither shadow that's cast by turning. And when we abide in your love, uh, we abide in you, uh, then we are just surrounded filled with your love and surrounded by your love and we become impervious as in a citadel and no evil thought or even the, or evil intention of anyone else or any danger can ever reach us without first having to penetrate through that wall of love becoming transformed in the process into harmony purity and beauty and love well get hold of a few pickups and upon that little habit of sitting down in the morning sometimes the longer pickups and that's my final message for you today, and I'll just say this. I want to give one illustration. Riding home uh, from a camp farthest out in the Beaver Dam, a little high school girl in the back seat was talking to other girls. She said, now I've been in heaven for a week, of a week. I've got to go home now and live in hell for a year, but I'll look forward all year to another week in heaven next year. And I, she didn't know I heard, and I turned right back and I said, you remind me of a man who... Uh, went to an osteopath, paid him three dollars, and ha had the luxury of a comfortable back on his table for half an hour. Then he'd go home to his, all his old tensions, but he said, I can look forward all week to that half hour luxury of having a comfortable back again next week. I said, why don't you carry your comfortable back? Why don't you carry your kingdom of heaven spirit with you? Well, that just shut up like a clam, embarrassed, and no more voice from her. But after about another mile or two, all of a sudden she piped up. I know what I was going to do. I have to do the dusting before, uh, uh, I'm going to get up before breakfast and uh, plenty of time and then get some of these books and have a meditation hour. And then I have to do dusting after breakfast and I'm going to dance around and have all the rhythm. <laughs> and then I'm going to sit down at 11 o'clock and write a letter to a friend telling him all about, I'll have a creative writing hour, writing somebody about the camp farthest just out and after supper. Uh, I'm going to let my brothers around me and I'll play the piano and we'll sing some camp songs. And then my father, one th reason it was hell, 
as her father was a preacher and he's always preaching at him all the time and his mother and the mother favored the sons and always was criticizing the daughter and I'll play the piano and we'll sing these uh, camp songs and then I'll tell dad he can give a Galilean address if you limit it to 10 minutes in the middle of the winter this minister who had never been in my home rang the bell he came in and sat down in my study and he said I came to thank you for what you've done to my daughter Grace uh, she's a new girl and she's turned us into a new family that's one thing you can do let's have a prayer Heavenly Father we're not going to home to dance the rhythms we may not go home to do any dusting but we've got some of the we men folks we've got plenty of dusting to do in other ways but Father we do want to go home and uh, just carry the spirit of the camp the spirit of heaven and uh, take uh, our hand uh, your hand in ours and hold on tight we're going to ask you to hold on tight to all of us thank you Lord in Jesus name Amen